I would like to start with thanking uh, Jesper, Didina and Nicolas for uh, inviting me to this nice conference. And I'd uh, like to uh, thank uh, Uber for allowing them or supporting them to invite me. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, I think as a, yeah, as a guest to this um, uh, fest, um, one should bring a, a present. I don't have a present. Uh, at least one should then have an anecdote. I have half an anecdote, and it's um, a semi-tragical anecdote. I think we met the first time at the end of the, I think the 90s, somewhere in Paris. There was a big conference, and I think we talked about uh, the Hubbard model and uh, thermodynamics, and maybe I um, expressed my, how to say, uh, critical view about TBA, and maybe you were uh, told me that you were quite happy with TBA or something like that. Anyway, we talked about the Hubbard model and I missed the chance to express my interest in um, the so-called um, spin one biquadratic chain, which is a temporal leap based model. And uh, that could have been the beginning of some collaboration. And I think we, we did not talk about temporal leap in those days. And I was completely ignorant of what is going on uh, in uh, polymer physics and loop models and so on. And um, in those days, I mean, uh, in the condensed metaphysics community, the Hallane's conjecture was uh, pretty popular. And um, the spin one by quadratic chain belongs to the class, but does not belong to the phase, to the Hallane phase. Anyway, then uh, in the further course of the uh, investigation of um, this spin one by quadratic chain, a complete classification of the states and enumeration was necessary, and for that one needs uh, a temporal leap representation theory. And uh, since this was a kind of hobby of mine, uh, it took 10 or 15 years to publish the results, although I had them somewhere in my drawer, but not the proper mathematical language and so on. And then after publishing these papers, well, then we had another. Um, meeting by email, I received a friendly email with communication of very relevant uh, 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 literature, and um, this would have saved me a lot of time if I had known these papers by Hubert and, um, and, and Nick Reed and, and Jesper a bit earlier. Okay, so today it's not um, the spin one by quadratic chain. I, um, the strategy for, for this talk is actually a uh, rather selfish uh, strategy. I don't want to educate anybody in the audience, certainly not Uber. I want to tell you about um, the um, investigation I did on the spin one half XXZ chain with non-parallel boundary fields, uh, open, it's open chain, and um, the fields break the magnetization conservation. And I think we, um, I and a few collaborators, I will name them um, shortly, we got quite far, but we got stuck somewhere. There's a point which is bugging me since a while. And maybe somebody can help. Okay. Um, the outline of the talk is, uh, I will show to you, just for completeness, the Hamiltonians of the spin one half Heisenberg chain with um, non-parallel boundary fields. We will contrast that or compare it to the periodic case. Um, well, um, there was earlier work for the uh, parallel boundary fields by Alcaraz et al. Now, the situation is rather curious for the um, spin one of Heisenberg chain with boundary fields. Um, the magnetization is not conserved, but the system is still integrable. So we have infinitely many conserved um, currents and uh, the model is in principle solvable, but it's difficult to do so. So usually we have the opposite situation. We have some Hamiltonian magnetization is conserved, but the system is not integral. So it's really um, an annoying situation. There are uh, solution strategies that use, all of them use um, young baxter etc. One solution strategy is built on fusion T system, Y system, I will um, flash a slide on, on this approach, but we have to dump it. And then uh, another approach is based on TQ relations. TQ relations are transformed into some kind of nonlinear integral equations. And I will show to you how to do that in the general case where now instead, or in contrast to the periodic uh, boundary case where we have 
two functions and two equations. Here we have three functions and three equations. And the solutions to these um, nonlinear integral equations show some interesting but still rather boring behavior, but numerically it's rather difficult to solve these nonlinear integral equations. Usually we do it like in TBA by uh, starting with some initial data and then we iterate these uh, integral equations and we have convergence. This is a little bit difficult in this present, ah, the present case. The collaborators are um, Holger Fram, um, Dennis Wagner and uh, recently Jin Zhang, who was an Alexander von Humboldt fellow and uh, only recently went back to China. Um, the Hamiltonian for the periodic case um, is given here for the case with open boundary and uh, fields on sites 1 and n is given there. So we are um, dealing with isotropic bulk interaction. Sigma vector is just a, um, denotes a free uh, poly matrices acting on site J and here on site J plus one. And um, this is a norm, I mean, the usual uh, spin exchange, um, SU2 invariant. Uh, due to Young Baxter and um, the usual reasoning, uh, we get infinitely many conserved charges by the uh, log derivatives of the transfer matrix. And the Hamiltonian is the first logarithmic derivative. The magnetization. Uh, which is the sum of all um, yeah, sigma components, for instance, the sigma components, commutes with all of these operators, H, the QNs, T. Not so for the, well, sometimes it's called off diagonal boundary, I mean, non parallel boundary fields. We have um, still sites numbered from 1 to n. We have bulk interactions between sites 1 and 2, 2 and 3, up to n minus 1 and n. And then on site 1 and on site n, we have two independent fields. Due to the SU2 symmetry, we can always arrange for the z direction in spin space such that the first Zeeman term consists just of the number H1z, only a z component of the magnetic field on site 1, multiplied with, a, uh, with sigma z, that we can always arrange for by, by SU2 invariance. Then, on site n, we would have all three components, H1z of, of the field H, uh, sorry, Hnz, H, um, uh, uh, Nx, and Hny. But the remaining uh, U1 symmetry, I mean, rotation on the z-axis, allows us to kill the y component. So we have three fields. On site 1, we have H1z. On site n, we have Hnz and Hnx. And the ratio of the two components, actually this transversal part to the longitudinal part, um, uh, that's um, the, what we call Xi, and Xi measures the amount of uh, breaking of uh, um, yeah, the magnetization or uh, the U1 invariance. Now, um, despite these fields at the boundary and despite this uh, transversal component, um, we have this curious situation that, in, in addition to Young-Baxter, we have the reflection matrix and the reflection equation, and we can set up for a commuting family of transfer matrices, which generates a Hamiltonian and infinitely many conserved quantities. So, um, well, maybe for the future use, these fields um, are replaced by the numbers p and q. So whenever I talk about p and q, I mean the reciprocals of the longitudinal components. And when I talk about xi, this is the ratio of the transversal uh, uh, part uh, to the longitudinal part of the boundary field on site n. OK, um, st still we have infinitely many conserved quantities for arbitrary values p, q, and xi. But the magnetization uh, operator does not commute with H and QN for finite value of Xi. What to do then? Well, in this situation, uh, people have studied um, many cases, subcases. Uh, for instance, in special cases of roots of unity and special boundary terms, um, TQ relations have been derived. Another approach is a rather robust or maybe universal approach is fusion, fusion with T systems, Y systems, etc. 
by Feynman collaborators. Also, separation of variables uh, was applied, sort of, yeah, I mean, successfully. Um, a curious approach was done by Cowett um, collaborators. They call it the off-diagonal beta ansatz, which is actually a a way to satisfy for certain functional equations this uh, transform matrix has to satisfy. The transform matrix um, uh, has to satisfy inversion identities and uh, some other identities. I will uh, focus on that in a few minutes. Then there's a so-called modified beta ansatz. And well, once again, uh, in 1987, the uh, parallel boundary field case was treated and uh, yeah, here uh, on one slide, uh, intermediate results by use of fusion TY systems for periodic boundaries. So that's a simple case. We have for the XXX chain an infinite series of functions Y1, Y2, Y3, etc. Now let us focus on the ground state uh, of, this, uh, of the Hamiltonian. Um, an infinite uh, series of functions which satisfy a uh, couple nonlinear integral equations, TBA equations. The driving term contains um, the system size n, so instead of minus beta over hyperbolic cosine, as in through thermodynamics, here we have n times log hyperbolic tangent. And uh, on in the first line, in all other lines, in the infinitely many other lines, the driving term is zero for the periodic boundary case. And then one can apply tricks and reduce this infinite uh, set of uh, equations to a finite set. For the off-diagonal boundary case, um, the algebraic part, or the, let's say the interesting part is still the same, but the driving terms are non-trivial in, in all of these lines. So all of the driving terms are non-zero, and therefore one has to deal with um, infinitely many of these equations, and uh, that's why this fusion and um, uh, uh, Y-system approach um, is, is not, not so useful in general. But still, Fram and collaborators um, applied this method and um, used truncations of these equations for the case of non-hermitian uh, boundary fields, or at least imaginary values of xi, and, and obtained results from that. In a, uh, stochastic setting. Okay, what do we want to do, or what do I want to show to you? Um, I want to show to you how to turn this so-called inhomogeneous TQ relation by Cow et al. into something useful. In fact, I have two mm, TQ-like uh, relations, and they call this one I'm using the alternative one. Anyway, when you look at it, um, you, you, you do not understand much. So they are, it looks like a TQ relation. On the left hand side, there's T. On the right hand side, explicit functions times ratios of Q, like in Baxter's TQ relation. Um, the fields P and Q appear somewhere. Little Q, I should say, little P, little Q. The U is a speckled parameter. Xi appears. But there's also a term where some explicit function is not multiplied to a ratio of Qs, but it's divided by the product of the two Qs. So how, how can you possibly use something like that? Um, yeah, this is a slide on how they got this expression. So they knew that this transform matrix T of U that you construct by use of the R matrix and the boundary K matrix, that it has to satisfy this functional equation. T of speckled parameter U minus 1 times T of U is um, a relatively simple function times identity plus um, high, higher order terms at U equal to 0. So at U equal to 0, the first non-vanishing term is of order U to the 2n plus 1. And um, yeah, that can be established by the definition of the transfer matrix. And um, furthermore, the eigenvalues of T of U are polynomials of this degree with high coefficient two and some other properties and symmetry. And then when you play around um, with a certain ansatz, then you succeed in 
satisfying these um, conditions. Now, what do we do now with this um, inhomogeneous TQ relation? Um, I, I can only flash to you what we did. It's difficult to explain why we did this. I mean, first of all, we reparameterized the spectral parameter. So we rotated by uh, 90 degrees in the complex plane and we shifted by, um, by some amount. The function t of u is now replaced by little t of x. And then we have a sum of three terms. And with, with suitable abbreviations, these terms can be written as some explicit function phi 1 times ratios of two q's, uh, phi 3 times the ratio of two q's, and phi 2 divided by q1 and q2. Now believe me when taking these terms, lambda, little lambda 1, little lambda 2, little lambda 3, and constructing or defining this function a, a bar c, I mean, it's just a purely mathematical approach. It's convenient to, 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 um, to study these functions. So, and we define them. And uh, only later, in the later course of the whatever calculation or analysis, it, it will appear why this is useful. Actually, 1 plus little a must be identical to that. 1 plus little a bar, identical to that. And 1 plus little c is identical to that. Um, some combinations of this type appeared before in our study of the TJ model, supersymmetric TJ model. And then when analyzing these functions, you realize that they satisfy well, functional equations that can be cast into integral <coughs> form. Log of little a, log of little a bar, log of little c can be written as convolution integrals of a certain kernel, a 3 times 3 kernel, with these functions log of 1 plus little a, log of 1 plus little a bar, log of 1 plus little c. Well, actually, for the case of the ground state, a and a bar are complex conjugates. That's why the notation appears. The kernel has uh, a 2 times 2 block, which consists of proper kernels that are more or less local. And then there are additional elements outside this inner 2 times 2 block. And these kernel elements are annoying. They are rather long range. This, this is a Cauchy kernel. This makes the numerical analysis somewhat difficult. The driving term is explicitly given here. I don't want to mm, um, yeah, mm, spend too much time on it. But these are explicit functions, logarithm of hyperbolic tangent, some gamma, little gamma function, which is actually a ratio of the z gamma function, or well, the logarithm of, of ratios of gamma functions. And um, yeah, so far so good, except that kernels of this type ring an alarm bell. But what also rings an alarm bell is that the driving term in the third line is a log of a polynomial. And that's it. So when increasing the argument x, the driving term increases without bounds. But we know that the function little c approaches a well-defined limit. It does not increase to infinity. Now, this calls for certain property of the solution function, namely that the function log of 1 plus a and log of 1 plus a bar, which are coupled by this, these elements to the function log a little c, that these functions have a winding that the imaginary part uh, increases by multiples of 2 pi i, sorry, 2 pi. And that leads to additional, ter I mean, so when, when evaluating that, um, then the integral terms, the terms um, produced by, the, by these convolution integrals, together with this here, give something which has a finite uh, limit for x to infinity. So it's a rather subtle situation, and this is uh, the core of the numerical problems. But let me tell you about uh, uh, the um, good side. The eigenvalue function is given explicitly up to uh, the finite size uh, terms in, in this formula. So the, um, the bulk term is, is given here. 
where the capital L function is again given by a log of uh, ratios of gamma functions. Here there are order one terms. P1 and P2 are somehow related to little p and little q, so to the boundary fields. And in the second and third line, there come the finite size terms. If when evaluating that, then you realize these are 1 over n terms. Um, there was recently a paper by, again, Carl et al, who obtained the, of course, the bulk term and also the order 1 terms by just yeah, ignoring the, uh, uh, the transversal field and um, replacing it by uh, uh, the, the parallel boundary field case. So here it comes in one, so to say, in, in, in one approach, in one. Um, yeah, now, how to calculate the finite size corrections, the so 1 over n terms. For the case of uh, the boundary fields, um, p, little p and little q, these are 1 over hz terms um, with uh, values minus 0 0.6, minus 0 0.3. And the xi value equal to 0 0.1, and for a rather moderate value of n, of the number of sides of the chain, the solution is shown. Um, real part and imaginary part of log of 1 plus little a are shown here in black and red. And you see there is a, this winding. So the function um, 1 plus little a moves around 0 two times, the first time here and the second time there. And uh, the function c is purely real. The imaginary part shown in blue is just 0. And uh, here's shown in green the real part. The function log of 1 plus c or, yeah, is negative uh, for most of the um, most part on the, um, the graph. Yeah, so what do we observe? Um, for small values of, the, of xi of this um, so to say, breaking of the magnetization, the kinks or the um, um, yeah the kinks in log a, uh, they are far from the origin. And actually, when sending psi to zero, these transitions or the windings move out to infinity, to plus infinity and minus infinity. Um, it is relatively relatively difficult to understand why these kinks should appear. Uh, okay, if they don't appear, then uh, function c will be in trouble. But when you look at the, at the expressions for uh, the functions a and a bar, it's difficult to understand that, they, that these functions a and a bar want to encircle minus 1. And it's an interesting exercise to look at the, these nonlinear integral equations that I showed to you, replacing the, um, the driving terms just by 0, and then checking that not only constants satisfy these nonlinear integral equations, but also these non-trivial, well, or semi-non-trivial rational functions. So these integral equations, even with zero driving terms, have non-trivial solutions. Um, OK, so what can we do for xi equal to 0 at xi equal to 0? We can calculate by use of the dialog trick um, finite size corrections. Um, these kinks disappear. The function c is no longer a problem. And uh, well, there we have to distinguish two cases. The left and right boundary fields are 0, or the left and right boundary fields are um, non-zero. And we get the same result. Of course, the central charge of the uh, spin 1 half xxx chain is 1. And uh, we should get this. Um, I mean, Cardi's expression. So how do these calculations work? For the case xi equal to 0, the function c is just 0 and nothing couple, couples to a and a bar. So we get, again, a 2 times 2 system. Then in the large n limit, we manipulate these, equ these equations. We, we introduce a suitable argument x by shifting uh, the, the old argument by log n. So this is fraktur a, the new function, the scaling limit is called little a, is little a bar, Roman a bar. And we get this set of 
nonlinear integral equations where the system size n disappeared, the driving terms are pure exponentials, and then by use of the dialog trick, we can express the desired integral, namely exponentials times log of 1 plus a times 1 plus a bar in terms of, well, products of two log a functions, one being differentiated. And that is, of course, a complete differential. So this expression can be by change of the variable of integration from x to a uh, gives an explicit uh, integral. That's a dialog integral. And then putting everything together, evaluating this integral, we get the finite size term is identical to minus pi velocity divided by 24 n times 1. And that will produce or extends results by Alcaraz et al. and Asakawa et al. Now, um, the scaling limit in the dialog trick is possibly also um, applicable for the off-diagonal case where all three functions enter. After all, the kernel is symmetric, and that is necessary for this trick. Um, what is problematic is we do not yet fully understand um, the terminals of the scaling functions, or let's say the, these, these functions in the large n limit. In the large n limit, um, uh, usually, these nonlinear integral equations take a simplified form. They turn into algebraic equations. And uh, here it's different because uh, some elements of the kernel are of Cauchy type. If you rescale the argument of the functions, th these Cauchy kernels stay invariant. They stay. So even for the asymptotic behavior, they are integral equations. They don't become algebraic. So this is one of the problems. And, um, yeah, let me show to you some more graphs. Um, well, here, I, I like the values for these magnetic fields. Now, Xi is, I think, still the same value. N is a bit larger. Uh, here, I'm showing only the real part, the imaginary part of log of 1 plus a, and the imaginary, sorry, the real part of log of 1 plus c. Everything else is zero or can be obtained by uh, flipping. Now, when calculating these by the usual techniques, by, let's say, taking some initial data for the functions and then applying the uh, integral equations, the convolution operator, and then getting the next uh, step in the iteration. Usually, we get convergence, but not here. So what you see is I started with something close to the proper solution. So that's the a, a right. Mm, so what you see here, are about 10 lines. Uh, there are 100 iterations, and uh, after every 10 iterations, I, I plotted the, the, the line of the, of the function. So the function real part of log of 1 plus a looks rather stable. The imaginary part is not stable. And what you see is, with increasing um, uh, index of the iteration, these, this kink here moves to, uh, to the left, and this here moves to the right. Because I started with values which were a little bit to the left, had, an, so to say, an arrow to the left. And uh, similar things happen if I start with initial data, with initial data which are off to the right. Then in the further course of the iteration, they move to the right. So that's the ins ins unstable mode. So the location of these kings move upon iteration. What is rather stable is the shape of these curves. So upon iterative treatment, the shape converges, but the location of the kink moves away. So that is the trouble with these um, uh, with the numerical uh, approach. Now here, for a slightly smaller value of xi, uh, we managed to calculate to larger system sizes to n equal 10 to the 9. And of course, you do not see anything uh, except spaghetti lines. But well, maybe what you see is um, these kinks move. So, so this here, these are solutions to the nonlinear integral equations. And these are the lines pertaining to n equal 4, 10, 10 to the 2, up to 10 to the 9. So um, here you see the solutions. This, this is not numerical instability. These are solutions for different system sizes. OK, the functions don't look so exciting, rather boring. So it should be possible to, 
to improve on the numerical side of this. So what is left to be done is um, a proper numerical treatment and uh, learning how to calculate the asymptotic behavior in the n to infinity limit, despite the fact that the kernel of the integral equations is a co contains Cauchy kernels and uh, stays invariant under rescaling. So, and everything uh, happens on a log n scale. So one has to rescale with log n. Okay, this is now the summary of um, what I presented. Uh, three instead of two nonlinear integral equations for the spin one half Heisenberg chain with broken conservation of magnetization. I think it has a lot of potential, uh, but the direct iterative treatment of these integral equations um, suffers from instabilities and one has to invent new techniques. Now, I hope I'm still within time. What is left to be said is um, happy birthday, Uba. Uh, all right, thank you very much. So we have uh, plenty of time for questions. So the instability feels all, uh, so all easy when you... Sorry, sorry, I'm bringing the microphone. Any value of psi. So, so it once you have a, a perpendicular field, well, x, yeah. x component, then, then, then you, you have an instability. Indeed. Right? So it um, is more severe the larger the system size is. So if you have small psi value and the system yes. size is only 100 or 1,000, it's okay, but then when you increase, then sometimes, somewhere, it will be pretty ugly and everything will explode. That's the situation. And um, maybe, so often one can stabilize the behavior of these uh, in integral equations by combining these techniques and fusion. So uh, the y functions are even more boring than those functions. and. Yeah, so this is now rather technical. So there's a technique um, that allows to um, interpolate between these very finite um, systems of nonlinear integral equations and the TBA equations. Uh, you have to look into um, Junji Suzuki's paper from 1998, uh, uh, where he describes how to truncate. I mean, how to use a couple of y's, and then you you truncate with a and a bar. You can for the nearest neighbor, spin one half Heisenberg chain, you can truncate at the first level, then you have just A and A bar, but you can use one y, a single Y1 or Y1 and Y2, and then you can truncate. And um, yeah, okay, so this is now getting a but bit too technical. It looks like that it should normalize to the boundary sign bottom, right? Yeah, it should. Uh, yeah, yes, and but uh, not clear for me what, what would be the. The, the, the coupling, or the, the, the terms, either the real or imaginary direction. Uh, imaginary um. direction. If um. Or real? Real. I would guess real. Yeah. The Yes, but, but it's uh, maybe imagine, imaginary. Yeah. 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 I don't know in what direction. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. Yeah. It's, it's intriguing. But, um, so is this problem really only for XXX, the Cauchy kernels? Uh, no, you asked about the XXZ case. Yeah. Um, um, I thought about dealing with that, in particular looking at the XX case, because then many things are easier. Yeah. But uh, technically, it's somewhat different, um, because uh, I do not recall the, the, the details. But um, there is a term appearing in these um, inhomogeneous TQ relations, which is a sum over all of these roots, or so-called roots. Here, this term does not appear. There, it does. So you have uh, one additional unknown non term. I thought then I better leave the fingers from it. Uh, so I cannot really answer the question what happens in the XXZ case. I thought uh, focusing on the isotropic case is, is the most reasonable thing to do. Um, 
after all, the functions are boring, and it looks that if, if um, n goes to infinity, also these, these kings move to infinity, and if they move to infinity faster than log n, then the CFT analysis would be rather simple, because then it's just, I mean, the, the, the formula that we all know. Yeah? But that's a question. I mean, does it, do these kings for fixed xi move faster or at the same speed as log n? That's a question. And, and, and for answering that, one needs a proper asymptotic analysis. But for the asymptotic analysis, the Cauchy kernel is a bit of an obstacle. Can you say something about admissibility in this problem? Um, uh, once again, admissibility? Oh, admissibility. Uh, you, you whether um, which, which, which initial data or they are the set of functions which are. Uh, so are, you, are you actually solving? Are you sure to solve the eigenvalue problem for any solution that you find? Yes, um, I'm sure about that. Um, and to be absolutely sure, I did the following. I, I, I solved these so-called beta and z equations, calculated these functions, so to say, by, by the definition, and inserted that into the, in, into the uh, integral equation. Integral equation I satisfied 100%. So that's why I believe. Ah, and, and these solutions to the, it's the admissibility of the TQ relations, right? So the admissibility of these inhomogeneous TQ relations, where the solutions to those equations really correspond to eigenvalues, that has been checked for finite systems by Kao et al. Uh, so I, I did not check it. I, it could be that for sufficiently large systems or so, there are solutions which do not correspond to states. Uh, but I. My problems are different problems. I had a question about the previous questions and comments. This is not boundary sign, Gordon. Aha. Uh -huh. Because you have fields in two directions on one side, and this gives you a cosine of the field and a cosine of the dual field, both. And they have the same scaling dimension. Yeah, but uh, then, then it's, uh, uh, yeah. goes when, when goes to infinity. Um, um, I think they, they, for me there was always a natural bound psi equal to. Uh, I mean, but what, what, what do you mean? But it's yeah, a it's it's it oh, yeah, you can say. One of them looks like margin. All right. All right, uh, so maybe uh, let's uh, stop here and we have the coffee break. So let's thank uh, Andreas again. Thank you.